Thank you so much for joining us at the Art and Language Symposium today. My name is Stephanie Cristello. I'm the Director of Programming for Expo Chicago, and we're thrilled to invite you to the fifth edition of the fair this year. On the occasion of the fifth edition, we've conceived of something very special in collaboration with Jill Silverman Van Konegratz, who's joining us today, um, called the Art and Language Symposium. We'll be presenting three panels over the next three hours. The first one that's taking place right now is called Conceptual Paradise. What you were watching as everyone was getting seated was a clip from the film featuring artists Mel Ramsden and Michael Baldwin from Art and Language who are joining us today on later panels and directed by Stefan Romer, German film director who's on the first panel of today's roster. Also joining us is Philippe Mayai, collector and founder of the Philippe Mayai collection at the Chateau de Montsoreau in the Loire Valley, Jill Silverman Van Konegratz, a gallerist and his independent curator, managing Art and Language's work, and Guillaume de Sange, an independent curator who's worked with Art and Language on many occasions, whether he's liked it or not, <laughs> in many varieties. Um, please join us in welcoming all of our panelists for the first panel of this today's symposium. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Jill. This is Philippe. We have Stefan, whose film you've seen a short excerpt from, and Guillaume, who's here with us from Paris. Um, the format that we're going to start with is a kind of very loose uh, conversation that will take us through both the film as a project of Stefan's it was made 10 years ago and uh, is probably the world's most um, uh, intense and uh, full uh, rendering of a generation of artists who were uh, known as the conceptual artists that we that we know and love. And what we've seen is a small excerpt of 20 minutes of very, very interesting material uh, of interviews with Michael and Mel. And uh, I thought we would start with a bit of a discussion with Stefan, then liaise over to Philippe and his passion for the work of art and language, and then bring in Guillaume, who for uh, many inadvertent reasons has had them as a trope in his curatorial career. And then we'll all talk together. Uh, we will not have time in this segment for questions from the floor, so you have to hold on to your thoughts and your comments until we have the keynote, and then there will be 20 minutes at that point for a lot of back and forth between all of us. So, Stefan, um, conceptual paradise. How in your mind were you drawn to this notion that somewhere in this conceptual radical practice there is this idea of paradise? Uh, first of all, thank you very much for invitation to this panel, Jill. Um, there, like always, there is a kind of anecdote how this uh, uh, appeared in the whole process of four years of production of the film. And um, if I tell you the anecdote, I will take the wit away because um, the editor always asked me, why are they talking about paradise? And I, didn't, I, di I just didn't get him. And they didn't talk about paradise, they discussed paradigms, because <laughs> I asked for paradigms. And so this is, uh, now the wit is gone. But the interesting, uh, fascinating thing is that, for example, artists like uh, Lawrence Wiener took this as a, a hint to paraphrase it and to talk and to uh, uh, illustrate this in, in the discussion I had with him. And the whole project was, uh, I started with that already 2002, which is a long time ago, a very long, long time ago, because I had the feeling that the history, the anecdotes, the f time frame, the context of all uh, the things of post-minimal conceptual uh, work in the 60s were forgotten already. 
I have the feeling that around 2000, um, conceptual works became more or less a kind of uh, established old generation and lots of my students at that time took reference to post-minimal or conceptual work, but they were uh, not really willing to read the texts. So I was thinking, how can I present this material and this incredible interesting persons to a public that it will survive the next time? And, okay, thank you very much that you invited us here. It's a kind of a kind of form of survival that we can discuss this here. But would you uh, would you hazard a, um, a hypothesis? Because I think one of the uh, obviously the radical practice of art and language is is ongoing and continues today. And they're making work month after month in their studio in the um, English countryside. But I think f what you've highlighted is this sense that history has been erased and that the practices of the 60s and the 70s are lost to the young generation that is coming up very fast with young artists and young critics and young curators and something in this idea of conceptual paradigm which then became conceptual paradise um, it almost creates a recipe for some type of homeopathic remedy for a market-driven art world that in, in a way has moved very far afield from the values and the ethics and the questions and curiosities that your film highlighted of this generation. And I think one of the reasons that we're here today to discuss and unearth and revisit some of these ideas is to, um, is to make, uh, the, is, to, is to unbury what has been buried for want of seeing. And a lot of this work has not been visible for quite a number of years. And it's almost a cult following that allows us to make this adventure today because we haven't had these conversations recently. And the film was now made 10 years ago and it still uh, creates a lot of interest and people are curious about this period which uh, they didn't live through themselves, I would say. Yes, um, I agree, but let me, hopefully I'm allowed to get a little bit theoretical. Because uh, what interested me in art and language specifically in their practice was this combination of philosophical discourse and art practice. Contesting the object of art in a daily practice. Not just uh, delivering slick things, putting on the wall and getting some money for it. I'm getting a little bit uh, critical but also implying the critical discourse in the daily work. That was what I'm really fascinated in the 80s already. And I was a painter before I started to uh, study art history and uh, get involved in more theoretical discussions. And for me, the most important thing with art and language is that with their practice, they contest the 19th century tableau. The tableau is built of some epistemological processes like recognition, sensibility, um, appropriation, uh, tax taxonomy, and things like that. And for me, in every work of art and language, you can see the artistic processes, what they are contesting, what they are criticizing, what they are taking as a subject, and with what they are working. And this is the point for me. And I think it's a, it's a form of revelation in a way that is both unve unveiling this process at the same time that it's camouflaging it in making a work of art. Because the, uh, the, the, the great question of how do you render an, a, a work of art as something that has no object or materiality is that there is something inside of that experience of the object 
that is both taking away its presence and allowing its presence to exist. And this dichotomy is why there is so much tension in the paradox. And I think that's a bit what has grabbed you specifically. Absolutely. I think in this short sequence, I have to excuse a little bit because it was async uh, in the part we saw here, but I think in this short sequence, um, Mel and Michael are discussing one of the main important points of the whole history of art. And um, for me, it's amazing how in a situation like that, they are just ping-ponging the arguments and suddenly you think, wow! I got it, or maybe not, but then you can watch it again. The idea of the film, uh, let me say that uh, aside, uh, the idea of the film is a little bit that it's made in chapters. Because I was thinking already at the time that in the future, maybe more people will have a look at this as a DVD or a file or whatever, and then they personally can jump from one chapter to another chapter, and each chapter has a kind of issue where I, all the 57 artists I interviewed for four years, uh, bring into a kind of uh, a discussion or a dialogue through the technique of montage. That is the, the little thing behind that. Thank you, and great. And what I'm curious about is this uh, interest that you had very strongly in their work, which in talking to Philippe over the years, is very similar to the infection he got when he first saw their work many, many years ago. This, this dilemma of being attracted to something because of its immateriality. And I was wondering, Philippe, you've had this uh, deep connection to their work before you met them as, uh, as artists, and if you could uh, share with us maybe how this um, energy from their practice grabbed you so spontaneously when you were so young. Um, in fact, when, when I was uh, um, a student, I, I have already been raised, uh, surrounded by objects and painting uh, due, due to my family. Uh, my, my father was a collector. Um, I knew that something else uh, was happening uh, into uh, speaking about art, and that art was not only square and flat, and that uh, a happening could be art, uh, a piece of paper could be art, um, uh, a moment, uh, could be art, uh, uh, um, just a, a path, uh, and I didn't understand why and how uh, this happened. Then, then I, I first built uh, a library when when I was uh, a student, um, and I went to art through books and through arti artist books. Um, I met. Uh, uh, minimal and conceptual art uh, very fast uh, and decided uh, to, to build uh, or to give uh, uh, an idea of the time I was living in. Um, when the first time I, 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 I saw a work of art and language, uh, I, I directly thought it, it, it was not possible that um, artists could have taken a, a so risky position uh, inside the art world and uh, taken, and in fact, uh, be, being uh, very trusty uh, regarding the visitor. And I realized that they strongly believed that a piece of paper could be art. And to have, the, to, to have this happen, they first sought to the visitor to build their work. And I think this interaction between the work and the visitor and 
uh, this uh, activity, the, the work requires, is in fact uh, what for me is conceptual art. Um, in a in a in a funny way, it's also what Stefan was saying with this this uh, this risk, this ping ponging back and forth between their individual brains and then the brain of the the artist and the brain of the viewer. And I think what you're talking about is something that is an engagement that is far beyond the object itself and that it was something that you sensed uh, in a performative way, this risk. Yeah, but, but I, I mean, it, it explains uh, also because uh, it's explains also why um, one part of my life has been dedicated to build uh, a collection, and another part of my life uh, has been dedicated to bring uh, this work uh, in a public audience. And I loaned my, my collection to the uh, Barcelona Museum of Contemporary Art uh, seven years ago. Uh, it's still there. And uh, I had uh, the, the opportunity uh, two years ago to um, have uh, the Chateau de Montsoreau, uh, which is the, the only uh, castle of the Loire Valley built in the riverbed, uh, thanks to, to, to the regional state uh, of France and, and of the Maine et Loire, uh, to build a, a, a museum a contemporary museum I inside uh, uh, this uh, touristic uh, setting. Uh, um, I think we uh, have some images here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 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 it. Uh, and this mirror piece you you are looking at is is now uh, the, the 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 Joconde of the Tate Modern, because everybody is taking selfie in front of the mirror piece, and then it's. Uh, worldly shared uh, on social networks and uh, finally th the public uh, Michael and Mel uh, <coughs> th there is a, a video existing of Michael and Mel uh, saying that many 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 professionals uh, at during uh, between 1965 and 19 and 2000 maybe tried uh, to take pictures of the mirror piece, and they all have tried to, to give a, 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 a sense of a, a very minimal object. And once the mirror piece was on show at uh, Tate Modern, everybody was taking selfie, and you have this sense of uh, your uh, camera and you and this is what looks like what really looks like look look, look a, a, a mirror in fact it, it's maybe the best uh, maybe the public uh, has given the, the best response ever to the work uh, and we are waiting for for the next one So it's quite um, an interesting juxtaposition, this work inside the walls of a Renaissance chateau. And uh, it has also a bit of the, the ping pong that Stefan was referring to of the ideas going back and forth because this building has a personality of enormous strength and power. And the work of art and language from your collection, which is in the first installation, has a counter a counterbalance to that that is very discursive i would say has this been a big challenge for you this first installation of their of their work uh. <coughs> uh, it's it's very improbable in fact uh, it's it's um, brings a, 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 a very strong 
context for this work. And uh, for, for our first, um, we, we have opened five, five months uh, ago, and, and for our first exhibition uh, of the permanent collection, we, we have uh, tried to um, tell uh, what could be conceptual art uh, through uh, big installations. You have seen the, the mirror piece. Uh, we have uh, tried also to to uh, give an image of uh, the multiplicity of the practice uh, through text works, uh, through documents, through uh, editions and uh, films. And um, we, we are, uh, and we, we, we will uh, make our, our best to have uh, the chateau existing and the work existing, uh, I think. But it's I think you've done a very good job having been there for the for the opening. I think that the the diversity and the riskiness of the installation is a, a very interesting uh, reflection of the work itself, and the building provides a completely different uh, architectural frame around this very diverse, as you pointed out, practice. Yeah, you know, these chateaux uh, were uh, residency places uh, in the beginning. Then we, we are, uh, we are waiting people uh, there, and we are waiting for 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 them to to live a bit in it. Uh, it I, I hope we will uh, build a, a conceptual paradise <laughs> also, which takes us very, very naturally into Guillaume's. Uh, inadvertent uh, relationship with art and language because as you were saying when we were speaking together in Paris that you haven't really dedicated any specific time to doing vast research or to doing a single exhibition on their work but as you looked back you discovered they were always present as a trope in your mind in all of your different projects and maybe you'd like to share some of that with us. Yes, uh, when, uh, thank you for inviting me. And when you invited me to talk about art and language, I was at first a little embarrassed because I said, but what do I have to say about art and language? And then, uh, because I'm not a specialist of art and language, and, and I don't say that to excuse myself, but that's the, that's the truth. And, uh, but I'm a user of art and language. I'm a practitioner, can I say that? It means that uh, art and language has always, the work of art and language has, has always been a, a tool for me. And like all the tools, I don't really have to personally understand how it works. I don't have to really understand it. I, I, I actually, I, I use it, and I use it when I, I curate, when I write, and when I think. Um, and something which uh, uh, um, struck me after <laughs> your invitation, suddenly it's as if, you know, there is a, the idea of the, uh, it's called in France, scotomisation, scotomisation, that's something which is in your, always here, but you, you, you can't see it, but it's here, you know. And then it, you, you spotted that point. And then I realized that uh, I, I've done uh, uh, many shows with art and language, but even the shows that I, I've done lately, uh, without art and language, they were always sometime in my list of things thinking in my list. So they could have been almost in every show that I did. And that, what does that mean, actually? Is that um, um, I, like, like every curator, I have a path, a journey into the arts. So you change, you, you are moving, you know, my, 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 my relationship to art changes uh, not every day, but let's say every year, or there is a kind of, 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 uh, of uh, transitions, you know. And, and strangely, uh, uh, art and language as accompanied was still uh, uh, around me uh, when I was when I was changing uh, 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 my relationship to art, and especially to to do it briefly, uh, my, my my relationship to art changing from the will to understand, uh, uh, the will to know more, the will to shed light into uh, something that uh, uh, was more about the poetry, uh, the, the idea that there is nothing to understand and to go more into the, uh, the, um, uh, the unknown, you know? And then from this, from the beginning, from the concept to the poetry, art and language have been here around. Um, and, and I think uh, that it is because the art and language system is very open. 
It means that it opens so it can not adapt, it doesn't have to adapt, but it can be a reference to any kind or very different kinds of, of subjects. So I can give you some uh, example that uh, I did exhibit. And also I want to say that uh, I, I read somehow that there was a kind of break or you know a, sweet, a shift in the in the career of art and language, and I never felt that there was any shift in the career. I used uh, I, I showed uh, the paintings and the, the uh, more uh, textual, let's say more uh, conceptual, uh, uh, immaterial uh, art uh, uh, from the beginning. For me, it was it has always been the same work. I never had this idea of there is a, a difference in in this system. And uh, the first text that I wrote as an art critic was called Soft Office. It was called Fetishism, Capitalism, and Contemporary Art. And it was about uh, a kind of parallel between the dematization of art and the dematization of economy. And how this was a kind of very uh, tricky question as it was not a real dematization, but it was more uh, a shift or a kind of hiding the art object and focusing on other objects which were the substitutes of, of the material, uh, 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 which which lead to a, a aesthetic of administration. And of course, in that case, I uh, 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 quoted and I, I the text begins with a description of index uh, index one, and then I, I curated a show about transparency and and reflection and, and opacity in the 20th century, based on a, a book by Paul Sherbart called a Glass Architecture, which is a totally different subject. And art and language was part of of this exhibition with a painting that we borrowed to your collection. Uh, uh, Philip, uh, and then after that, another subject. I, I worked about basic forms in arts in an exhibition called Planet of Signs, and 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 in that uh, in that show, I showed uh, three pieces by art and language also. And, and more recently, uh, a show about labyrinths and wandering in the arts uh, uh, in Centre Pompidou Metz. In, in, and, and then I had I had a very I was very happy to show uh, a set of paintings from the uh, uh, series of Incident in a Museum. Uh, and lately, uh, uh, I, I I did another show about uh, socialist realism and art and language was not but could have been. It was part of my uh, of the of the notes I took. Uh, I did a show called o Void If Removed about the absence of the art object. Uh, and of course, art and language was also, could have also been in, in that show. And, and, and the new uh, program that I curate nowadays in Brussels called uh, Ballistic Poetry, about the idea of how at a certain time, uh, uh, after a certain time, the idea that the concept, the method, the um, uh, how can I say uh, the the program uh, suddenly is 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 uh, uh, broken is uh, is stopped by the image by the form and then how I like conceptual art in a very sensual and and, and, and poetical way. I want to just interrupt you for a second because I think what you've hit upon uh, in this uh, trajectory of your own curatorial work is that uh, the practice of of art and language is not only one thing, that their, their art making has been enormously diverse and it has evolved in its own shifts and, and changes as the decades have presented themselves. And I think part of what makes their work uh, evade categorization is this open edges, open-ended, uh, discursive, essayistic, program that includes and, and includes so many different genre blasting uh, ways of thinking that it, it, we, we, we can't say, oh, well, it's, it, this is what it is. Because in saying this is what it is, we all know that it's absolutely not that at all. And I think that... I would say I, would say I can say this is a bottle of water and I drink it. But it's, it's the difference if I put it in a frame of a performance or in the frame of just um, buying it in a supermarket. And this is, for me, one of the points of the work of uh, the practice of art and language. It's not so much about producing new objects. It's more about uh, contesting the, the context, how the object of art can be discursively produced and then be materialized in a kind of exhibition or presentation or whatever. So you have different forms of context or frames, in earlier times we called it frames, um, that give the object a kind of frame. 
this is the, p the point for me. And that's the difference with a bottle of water. But at the same time, I would think that this discussion of invisibility and the column of air over Oxfordshire, I mean, when Mel says, well, the column of air over Oxfordshire is the text, is writing about the column of air, the work of art, is the column of air the work of art? Where does, where does our idea of objectness come from and how many different facets of practice can enlighten us about the different relationships. Yeah, we, we, we had uh, today uh, a discussion about this column of air, which is uh, uh, apparently, uh, given the text, uh, situated in the Oxfordshire show, uh, in the Oxfordshire, and um, how uh, could you uh, show it uh, in Chicago. You know, that is do, you, do you have to <laughs> rewrite a text, or is it this idea of the column of air in the Oxfordshire that's important, or do you make uh, transportation of this column of air to Chicago? It's it's in in a way. Uh, it, it brings a, a, a complete world in itself, this piece of paper. It's not, it's not transparent at all. I think, it's I think more or less it's always a question about representation. And uh, if we talk about representation, it's a, a question of uh, sign, the, uh, the understanding of sign. I mean, there's Anne Rorimer sitting somewhere here, and she was uh, uh, one element of this great project Forest of Science. I think it was, uh, you have to correct me, it was in the end, end of the 80s, something like that. That was for me a kind of uh, a firework in my brain as I read this text. And uh, when you talk about representation, it's always entering a forest of science and then you have to make decisions and blah, blah, blah. Then it starts to become complicated and interesting, bloody interesting. It's, it's, in a way, it's virtual be becoming concrete. Which is... Uh, a, a, a it needs a shift. It need, uh, it's an unstable place to try to move towards or from in some way. I mean, you're, you're defining something that has two qualities at the same time, both of which are pulling against each other. No? Shall we go into deeper philosophical questions now? Well, I don't know. Or shall yeah, we I ask the masters of are, the discourse? I think we still have another five minutes. I want to go back. I want to take this into, into something that Guillaume was, was talking about, because you have pushed uh, in your practice using the, the instrument of art and language. You've, you've uncovered all of these different aspects of their work. At the same time, they've these aspects have been almost vehicular for you in creating uh, another level of, of awareness in the context of a, of a larger exhibition using many different artists for an experiential purpose. And I want to talk about this with regard to representation because it is, a, it is a bottle of water, but the experience is different than the object. And what we were... In, in fact, you know, it... It's raising a, a lot of questions. Atanagogy is raising a lot of questions, and it will raise a lot of questions. And we, we don't need necessarily to, to answer this question. I think uh, um, the, 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 the work stands also in his capacity to uh, create or to build questions. With and, without and, response. And yeah, and that, that's why we, we need uh, the work to be public and in a public sphere for uh, people to uh, bring these questions to, to us and to, them, and to themselves. No. Because one question is always hiding another question. Mm -hmm. There is some reason to, to, to ask questions. And in this sense, it's not a closed system. But yeah, yeah and, and you, you, I think you, you, you mentioned the word 
hiding. And for me, personally, the question of hiding, the question of absence, it was, was uh, for me, art that I like. Uh, I, I, I think that the hidden part is, is as important as the visual, as the visible part. And all, for me, that, that's why art and language has been very interesting, that it was not m m a lot about like giving answers, or, or it was more about, about sharing uh, ignorance, mainly. And I, 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 I'm... I'm I might be wrong, but I, I, I think that when I curate a show, I, 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 don't, uh, I don't share knowledge. In a way, I share a certain relationship to ignorance. And I share uh, a certain... Uh, I, I'm not so much in advance with my audience. I'm not like full of some kind of knowledge that I can uh, uh, bring and, and distribute to the other. But I, but I can share questions, I can share uh, desire, and I can share uh, frustration, and I can share also the impossibility of things to really uh, work or functions. And, and this uh, critical point, that is the point that I also am seeking in art. I'm, I'm seeking that as a curator. When I curate a show, it has to be critical in that, in that way, and, uh, and, the, and the hidden part of the missing part of it. And, and I, 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 f I found in the work of art and language, every time I was uh, confronting this idea, kind of, of helpers, like people in the same, in, en France, in French, we say la, la même galère, the same like problems. You know, we share the same problems. But they, they found very good way to uh, uh, make a form out of that, yeah. to, to, to share it. And it goes beyond discourse. That's also what I like, which can be kind of paradoxical because it's supposed to be a, a, a discursive textual work, which it is. But you, you, you understand that it's not it's only not that. It's not only that. It's not only that. And, and you know that what I call poetry, which is part of the work alive, it's a part of the signal that, that escape uh, uh, the, the uh, receptor but also the emitter. <laughs> it means that there is a part that I, 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 I feel that there is a part that escape also their own uh, 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 maybe grasping or understanding or mastering, let's say. And this part is also very important and they don't hide it, they totally acknowledge it. And that's maybe why it can be embarrassing for, uh, uh, I mean, a kind of ideal uh, of purity, of conceptual thing which go directly to the truth with, with, uh, with, with a sharing a kind of definitive system. But I also like very much what you were saying uh, in our previous conversation that it is both intelligence and sensuality and that this, this, this border between the mind and the senses is very present in the work. It's very present in the work. For me, it was exactly that. And yeah. as soon as you begin to hide something, of course, you play you with that. You want it more. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and uh, uh, I mean, uh, as a curator, I always like the exhibit. I don't want to choose between intelligence and sensuality. You want both uh, at the same uh, I time. want both, of course. In I large want both. quantities. And, 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 and I, I found both uh, in, 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 the, in the work of art and language very much. And I must also say now that I... I uh, I am, I, I am more, uh, uh, I would say, uh, um, legitim, legitimate, legitimate, legitimate in yeah. the art that maybe I shouldn't, uh, I wouldn't have, have dared saying that before. But the central part of it was maybe the first thing that 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 that, that brought me to to uh, to be interested in the work of, I would say, conceptual art in general, mm. uh, and 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 art and language in particular. Mm. Mm. I think we are. Right on the mark. Yeah. So hold your thoughts and questions, and we're going to leave the stage because there's a very special performance. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Jim. Thank you.